Hello, all you rabid Lions fans, and welcome to Lions on the Prowl. News, rumors, and debates from the fans' perspective. Here's Jim and Tim. Hello, all you Lions fans, and welcome to Lions on the Prowl. My name's Jim. And my name is Maniac Tim. And this week we have a very special guest, and we're going to get to him in just a minute. But Tim, do you got any shout-outs this week? Okay, Brian from work, Colt from work, Tim Reardon from work, and that's it, Jim. That's it. Okay, I got Heather, Shannon, um, and Lindsay uh, gave me a suggestion. So she's a Bears fan, unfortunately, but oh. we'll let that slide. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can hear us on iHeartRadio. Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and pretty much wherever podcasts are uh, are uh, available. So this week we have the correspondent for the Lions from ESPN, Mr. Mike Rothstein. We're going to bring him in right now. Hi, Mike. How you doing? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for coming on with us. Uh, this year we uh, have kind of a similar feeling, at least in my opinion, of. Last year. Of last year, where the Lions weren't doing very well in preseason, and they were kind of hyped up to do better. We have some injuries this year. What do you, what's your take on this team so far as they stand? I mean, listen, let's let's be real. The preseason is the preseason. To me, what I look for here is I look for a few things. I look for effort. I look for discipline, and I look for player development. I don't care about the score. I don't really worry about – scheme or well because they don't really scheme at all but i don't really worry about how things quote unquote look other than when the starters are in and so far for the most part especially offensively the starters haven't been in so i'm not as pessimistic as maybe i was last year on how this might go and when you looked at last year you saw a bunch of substitution type errors a bunch of effort situation things plus you saw what was going on day to day and those are things that i'm just not seeing this year so to me i'm more in the thought process of listen that first game was bad now by every stroke imaginable it was bad you didn't see any development you saw depth players struggle and to me that's where If there is going to be an issue at this point that you should be concerned about, it's depth. I thought you saw a lot more yesterday or rather Saturday night on on what kind of their depth might look like. And I thought you saw a lot of improvement there from guys who are going to be maybe players, you know, 35 through 53 on this roster. And to me, that's fine. This offense still hasn't seen Matthew Stafford in a game yet. I know there's some concern about that. To me, eh, I don't know. I'm not really bothered by Matthew Stafford not playing the first two games of the preseason. He's in his 11th season. At this point, if he doesn't know how to get ready for a year and he can't get ready on his own, then, man, that's that's a bigger problem (laughs) than than (laughs) anything else. So I look at that and I say, as long as he plays this week against Buffalo, to me, that's really all that would matter. I know there's some questions about his health, and, and, you know, at least on Twitter and all that. Let's he did practice all week in Houston. He did practice against the Patriots. You know, we don't get to see practices fully anymore because they're going to go into regular season mode here. So let's see if he plays against Buffalo. If he does play against Buffalo, I think, and he looks okay, I think you don't have to worry about that as far as, like, the world is falling type thing. I still don't know where this team is going to be this year. I think the NFC North is a very, very tough division. I think their schedule is very, very difficult. But I'm not thinking, oh, sky is falling just based off of these two preseason games where you saw mostly backups. And defensively, they haven't been – putting their full defensive line, which is maybe the biggest strength on this team on the field at all for various reasons, be it guys coming kind of rounding in a form like a Damon Harrison or injuries, what like Trey flowers coming back from injury and Deshaun hand being injured as well. Yeah. I mean, that's a concern too. The injury problem for me is a concern. Um, also offensive line. I'm, I'm noticing Joe Dahl get, is getting uh, more of the starts and more of the reps now. Do you think he's going to win that left uh, left guard position? It would seem like it at this point, but, and I say this with a but, 
Obviously, Terrell Crosby's injury leaves them kind of shorthanded at tackle, and it would seem like they want a, a combination of cross train and also see what they might have from Kenny Wiggins at tackle. Because if he's going, if he's not your starter and he's your sixth or seventh lineman, your lineman up on game day, then you want to see if he can play guard or tackle because then all of a sudden that gives you more flexibility with maybe who else you keep up, right? Because mm, that makes sense. Say, say Kenny Wiggins can play tackle and he can play guard. Let's just say that, right? Well, then that opens up, do you want to keep up an extra interior lineman on game day? Like say an extra guard, like maybe an Ode Abouche if he makes a team or a Bo Benchwal or a Luke Bowanko, or do you want to keep up a fourth tackle or even a third tackle like a Tyrell Crosby or whoever their fourth tackle might be, whether it's Andrew Donnell or Ryan Pope or TBD, because maybe that person's not on the roster yet. So I, I think that that might be part of it. It wouldn't stun me to see Kenny Wiggins come back and win that job. But at this point, Joe Dahl really seems to be in a position where he's at no worst their sixth lineman. And at this point, seems like he has the inside track for the left guard spot because, frankly, you need that offensive line cohesiveness. And they worked him with the starters pretty much exclusively yesterday or on Saturday. And that, to me, signals at least he's in the lead for this job. We'll know more, obviously, after the game against Buffalo because if he's still the left guard against Buffalo, then to me that signals that, yeah, he's won that job. Also, I'm well. There's a lot of fans out there, so we do our podcast from the fans' perspective. So we're giving you some of that information that they are not sold on Patricia and Quinn. What do you see about uh, about them and their plan as you see it unfold? Oh, I totally understand that, I, and I'm not sold either. I don't think. I, I think if you think you are sold at this point. I'm curious what you've seen to tell you that because they have been six. They were six and 10 last year. And yeah, I mean, as much as I'm talking about like the preseason is not a big deal. And I think that Patricia's run a much, a much smoother camp this year than he did last year. Yeah, there, there should be concern because you haven't seen it. And at the end of the day, that's what really matters, right? Is do they win or lose on Sundays and until you see whether or not they can win or lose on Sundays when it counts, you have every right to be skeptical. Bob Quinn, I think, has done a decent job building this roster. I think there's more depth there than there has been in the past, particularly at certain positions. I think he's made some very shrewd moves particularly tra in trades and in some waiver pickups like Romeo Aquara might go down as one of – Romeo Quara and Snacks Harrison might go down as his two best moves yeah. as far as like player personnel moves if you think about it. Because Aquara was cut by the Giants. No one really expected much out of him. And he led the team in sacks last year and looks good and looks like he's going to be a potentially breakout player again. Snacks Harrison completely changed their defense by getting him. And obviously, we haven't seen him yet this year. But you saw what he did last year and you know what he can bring. Mm-hmm. So I and look Mike, at that. And I think, I'd look from, at Mike Daniels too. Yeah, Mike and Mike Daniels doesn't even get. That's the thing. I mean, Mike Daniels hasn't even stepped on the field yet. Nobody's really talking about him, but man, he's good too. And that defensive line is so deep that that's something he's really built because most of those guys that are on this team right now were brought in by him. I think all of every guy, if my memory serves correct, right now was brought in by Bob Quinn. So he did a really mm -hmm. good job building this defensive line from a depth, perspe depth perspective. Yes, he's made mistakes. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Tease Tabor, listen, we don't know if he's going to make this team or not. He's been hurt. That was a looking like a massive mistake on his part and something he really stuck his neck out on because he said, you know, I watched more tape on him than I did on anybody, and he felt really good about him. Okay, so, uh -huh. And you say, yeah, okay, there's going to be mistakes, but I, I think Bob Quinn's done a decent job building this roster. Well, again, as I've said, it still goes back to 
the ultimate answer, which is what do they look like on Sundays? What do they look like on game days? And when guys inevitably get hurt, how bad is that drop off? And you're seeing that a little bit. Obviously, Stafford hasn't played at quarterback, and it seems like they're trying to really figure out that situation. Tom Savage, I thought, was a a decent backup option. You know, he's not going to be the best backup in the league, but he's got some starting experience. But now he's hurt, so you're kind of in searching mode again. And listen, that's going to always be their biggest problem is if, you know, Matthew Stafford goes down, this team sunk. But you can say that about half the league. So that's kind of that's a long answer. I understand it's a very roundabout answer, but I think I think you have every reason to be skeptical for sure as a fan, as a member of the media. But I, I think Bob Quinn's done a decent job. But the it's still very much TBD on both of these guys, and it's going to be a really big year for both of them. Okay. Uh, okay. Do you think they're building the team more for now to win now or to win more in the future or kind of both? I mean, I think any good general manager and head coach combination looks at – the long term and the short term, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to win now. In the Lions case, in this coaching staff and general manager's case, yeah, they probably need to win now because fans are going to get extremely restless and Martha Ford has shown that she wants to win and you know she's definitely different than her husband as far as maybe her amount of time that she'll be patient, you know? So you see that. But I think they're also doing a good job of building for the long term, building depth, getting young talent. Now, we'll see what happens. They, I think they need to win this year. I think they need to at least show improvement this year from what they did last year, both from a competitive standpoint and from a win-loss standpoint. I mean, if they go 8-8 eight and eight, but they're competitive in every game, to me, that's significant progress whether they make the playoffs or not. And, and you can show Martha Ford and you can show Rod Wood if you're Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia, look, you're building something and there is progress there. They need to show progress this year because if they don't show progress this year, if they're 6-10, and 10, barring some injury to Stafford, right, or some crazy amount of injuries where, like, their whole offensive line gets hurt or, like, their entire secondary goes down, you know, something that's that that's kind of – in football terms, cataclysmic for like the depth of your team and what you're building, you have to show progress this year. You have to be, I think, eight and eight or better to say, look, listen, here's tangible proof that what we're doing is getting there. And if they can't say that at the end of the year, then I think there are going to be some big questions and maybe some decisions, maybe some decisions to be made. Although it would it would pretty much have to be a catastrophic type of season, I think, for there to be a major decision. But this, I point. kind of agree with that too. I'm yeah. as a Lions fan, we always get excited about our new players and the draft and the off season, and yet we really never have that feeling that we're going to win. So it's like it seems like this is a year to year to year process. Last year, uh, Tim said we were going to go twelve and four, which obviously we didn't. A lot of people have a lot of optimism, and then they get let down. I guess my question is, what does the outside media see on our team that we don't? What's the weaknesses, the big things that stand out to you as a reason why this team's not ready to compete for um, the the NFC North, perhaps, or going deeper in the playoffs? So that's an interesting question, because I think what happens is, you know, fans and and sometimes even media get get put in a silo, right? Like you 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 you're, you have tunnel vision because you're following this team day to day. You're passionate about this team day to day. If you're a fan, you're covering this team day to day. If you're a reporter, so you see those things, right? And you kind of look at it from a very specific point of view. But the majority of this league, other than what New England and you know, I mean, arguably maybe Seattle the last few years, but they've even taken a dip, right? Right, right. The majority of this league lives in 7-9 and nine to 9-7 nine and seven every year. And the majority of the, the league is built for parity, so there are ebbs and flows to it. Um, so I, I think that you just got to keep that in mind 
at least I try to. I mean, when I do my prediction every April and I, I catch grief for it on Twitter and, you know, and really even when I do them kind of towards the beginning of the season, which is the more realistic one, I'm always in the eight and eight range. And why is that? Because that's where the majority of the teams lie. And look at the Lions. So this is my seventh year covering the team. Look, every year that I've covered this team, except for two, they have been between nine and seven and seven and nine. And that was Jim Caldwell's first year. They were 11 and five. And last year they were six and 10. Every other year they're in that window. And the majority of teams are in that window. So you need to me, I'm like, well, they're they're an average NFL team. I don't don't think they're the worst team in the league. I don't think they're a bottom five team in the league. I think that they've they've been very much in that mediocre range for a long, long time. And when you look at that, you say, okay, where are the weaknesses? Where are the strengths? Which is to what you ask and maybe what people don't see. I mean, I think their strengths this year are on the defensive line. I have concerns about that second cornerback position. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't take much into Rashawn Melvin getting beat by DeAndre Hopkins on Saturday night, especially on that goal line route. Almost every corner in the league is going to struggle with that. Darius Slay would probably struggle with that particular route as well because Duke Hopkins is is amazing, right? Right. So yeah. you look at that and you say, all right, I'm concerned with that secondary. I do have questions at linebacker. I think they have more depth there. But until I see Jelani Tavai in regular, I think he's played particularly well. But until I see how they use him and Jared Davis, until I see Jelani Tavai play at regular season speed, that's a concern to me. Um, why receiver depth? Very much a concern, and I think that that's a valid concern because Marvin Jones. Listen, we don't we don't know what's going on right now. He didn't obviously travel to Houston. They say he's working out. I, as of now, I expect him to be ready for the regular season, but who knows? They've been pretty cagey on what's going on there. So you and he's also had history where yeah, he misses games because of injury. Kenny Galladay has missed games. In his career because of injury. Danny Amendola in his history has missed games due to injury, right? So you look at the wide receiver depth and that would concern me as far as where they stand there. And yeah, the offensive line, I think, still should be a concern. I thought they looked better last night than certainly they did in week one, but they barely played in week one of the preseason. But until you see them actually block Matthew St- for Matthew Stafford until you see them actually open up holes, until you see them do that consistently, I think that's going to be a concern. So that, to me, is where the areas of concern would lie. And that might sound like a lot, but I don't think that's much different than if you look at many teams around the league. So many, so much of this league, you know, you're, you're predicting 12-4, and four, or last year you predicted 12-4. and four. I don't know what you're predicting this year, but so much of this league is – one or two games going a different way and that's the difference between being in the playoffs and not that's the difference between a coach keeping his job and not and that's just what this league is so i think the lions are right in that range of the middle of the league and you know you you break out of that by getting lucky on some draft picks getting hot at the right time you know, and you saw that in 2014, they got hot at the right time. And frankly, they that was a really good football team that they had built, and they just ran into a tough, t- a tough kind of toss up, pick 'em loss at Dallas. And you know, their best, their best asset, which was defense, not to go back to 2014, but their best. Asset was that defense that year, right? That defensive line mm-hmm. was fantastic. That front seven was great. And in the last drive of the season, what ended up being the last drive of the season, it maybe had its worst performance, other than that game at New England when the Patriots just shredded them. I mean, that's <laughs> what, what can you do about that, right? right. Like that, and, and that's the difference between winning a playoff game and not. That's the difference between... Winning a division and not are, are small things like that. And, you know, listen, if if they win that playoff game in Dallas, how much changes? You know, maybe Jim Caldwell and Martin Mayhew are still here. And right, Tom LeBron, if they win that, if they keep in Dominick and Sue, I don't th- – I mean, we're playing the what-if game here. But, like, 
and I don't know how we got off on this tangent, but <laughs> you know, no. If but if you look at it, if they keep in Dominic and Sue after 2014, do you think they start off one and seven? No, Probably no. not, because their defense is that good. And then maybe they don't get rid. Maybe they don't make the change that they made that brought in this regime. So there are so many little factors going into that that that's why I'm just kind of like that's just where you live as as a as a franchise. But that's where the majority of franchises live. Um, unless you get an MVP type guy as a quarterback or an amazing defense. And you saw that a few years ago with the lions in 2014, they just weren't able to keep that group together due to injury and free agency. As fans, we see this over and over. You mentioned the Dallas game and you mentioned it could have been a toss up and all this other stuff, but there was a big call, non call in that game. (laughs) Uh, and they're picking up the interference <laughs> flag. Um, there's, you've covered for seven years, so I'm trying to go back to stuff that is relevant uh, to your time frame. So uh, the Seahawks, where they batted the ball out of the end zone. I mean, there's all these things that keep coming up against the Lions, and maybe it's because we have that, um, tunnel like you vision. said, that tunnel vision that we, you know, we only see our team. But it seems like the Lions get screwed more than most. I'm just <laughs> trying to say it like it is. Uh, go, go talk to Saints fans, man. Oh, yeah. But, you know, they're going to do saying. something. They, they change the rules for other teams when they have something that goes wrong, and it takes us years to get the Calvin Johnson rule changed that screwed us in Chicago. There, there's just over and over and over Houston Texans game where they, they, they are clearly down. You know, the guy gets up, runs in the end zone, Schwartz throws the flag, and then we get penalized for him throwing the flag, and now they can't review the play that's obviously down, and they get a touchdown out of it. Well, that, that was Jim Schwartz not necessarily knowing the rules. I mean, right. like, but, I, I don't know. I I don't buy into that as much. I, okay. Yeah, they've had, listen, they've had, the Lions have had situations that have gone against them that have been unfortunate, you know, for them, but... I mean, Matthew Stafford led how many fourth quarter comebacks in 2016? Yeah, right. Like, you know, I, you, you look at those things. I, I think it evens out at the end of the day, and, and it shows maybe where you are truly uh, as a franchise. I don't I don't buy that. Yeah, they, they've been – I mean, because look at the opposite, right? In 2014, they go to England, and Matt Prater misses that first kick. Yep, he did. And they get the redo on that kick. And, I mean, they don't win that game. Who knows if they make the playoff? You know, who knows how the rest of that season goes? Because they lost fairly in that game. So there are, I think, fans remember the things that go against them more than the things that happen for them, if that makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely does. You know, and, and that's part of it to me of like, well, yeah, they've had some things go against them. But you go to the we go back to the Dallas game that pass interference call. They were still leading, and if Sam Martin doesn't shank the punt, and then their defense, as we were talking about before, doesn't fall on their face, then you're not talking about that call anymore. That call doesn't right. matter, right? Right. Like they still had a chance to win that game, and you you that's that's to me what I look at and I say, eh. You know, I mean, I just can't I just can't get worked up over that sort of stuff because I really do believe it balances out Um, an old college basketball coach that I used to cover, Mike Bray, who's the Notre Dame head basketball coach. He always used to joke about karma and like law of averages and stuff like that. And I, I think it's true. And I think that if you really, really look at it, you'd see that it kind of balances out and evens out. It's just you remember the negative ones you remember the the bad ones more than you remember the ones that maybe went in your favor um i think the lions specifically have had a few that have gone against them that have just happened in critical end game moments that and that's part of why they stand out more between the seattle batted ball the aaron Rodgers free play hail mary and the dallas you know situation that have happened all in critical situations and that, and maybe the Atlanta runoff, the Atlanta runoff yeah. as well. Although that yeah, was the Atlanta runoff was right by the rules. I mean, you couldn't get. We just you know, felt so, like the rules were wrong. Sure, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, that that to me, if if you want to look at one that you're like, man, that one was of all of them, right? That right. was the one to me that I was like, man, that's the most questionable because, like, there there wasn't anything you could do about that. 
Right. Like that's just an auto auto review play. So to me, like if you really want to get worked up, that would be the one, not any of the others, because all, all any of the others are either your own fault or you had time left in the game to make a difference. Dallas, you had time left in the game. Defend does, a Hail Mary and you're good. It, my question here is, but does it change the momentum of the game? Mm, it can, but it, you shouldn't let it. Right. Like, yeah, football's a game of momentum, mm-hmm. of momentum, but the Lions had the momentum in that Dallas game for the majority of that game. The Lions had the momentum in that Hail Mary game. Like, you you defend a Hail Mary, you win that game. Now, oh, yeah. right. who Clearly. knows if they go to St. Louis next that next week and they might still lay the egg they laid in St. Louis and then it doesn't matter, right? right. Like, I mean, so many things had to go right that year, that the second half of that year, because what they did in the first half for them to even – have a shot at the playoffs but i don't know i just don't buy into that like okay okay I, you 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 need to you you're a professional you need to not let momentum or a bad play or a bad flag affect you and that goes to coaching and that goes to to being a player you just gotta you know you hear players right. say it all the time short memories and going play to play well you have to be able to do that when it matters. And, you know, so many of these situations that we've been talking about here, um, that that just didn't happen. And that kind of is where it stands out to me. The Atlanta one is the one that you can't you can't really do anything about that if you are a player or a coach, because and that, so that would be the only one that I if I were a Lions fan, which I've been very open of saying I, it doesn't matter to me. I'm a reporter. I cover this team win or lose. And that's kind of how it goes for me that would be the one that if i were rooting for the i'd be like man that one that one stunk but <laughs> you know i right. and, and i think you saw no i think you saw what mm-hmm. the league eventually did with that and they you know they kind of worked on it okay uh unfortunately over the years we have seen where the lions don't play a complete game uh where it takes you know uh the offense don't wake up basically until that fourth quarter and it's basically a shootout to come back. Uh, do you think Patricia is trying to more or less change that? Do you see that uh, this year we're going to see more competitiveness throughout the entire 60 minutes of the game? I mean, I think that that's what he's hoping for. That's that's what he's training this team for. That's what he's building for. Complete games are a myth. Let's be honest here. Very rarely do you see a team say yes played a complete game because there's always something that they can get better at you know you look at any team in the league and they play 16 games maybe if they get one or two quote-unquote complete games and i'm talking about these are even the teams that go 12 and 4 13 and 3 some of those games they win you know 12 or 13 7 some of those games they win 45 35 well that's not a complete game because one of your units didn't do very well there if that's the score right right so you look at that and you say i don't know i I don't buy the complete game thing all that much it's what they all strive for and what they should strive for because you're going to win if you do that but that's kind of that unattainable perfection that kind of everyone kind of strives for it and you don't really get, at least in my opinion. Okay. Uh, to, to your question of do I think they'll be more competitive throughout, I think that's what they're aiming for. That's what they're hoping for. They're, they're trying to get away from the slow starts that have plagued them, no matter the coach, no matter you know the roster construction. So I think, yeah, they're trying to get away from that and they're going to try to build on that and try to, you know, get off to fast starts. But every team wants to get off to fast starts and every team wants to to be able to do that throughout four quarters. It's just really, really hard to do because there's so much parity in the league and so many of these teams are the difference is one or two or three players or or talent type level players uh, or bounces of the ball, as we've been talking about for a lot of this podcast or, you know, decisions that are made. And that goes throughout the game. So I, I think that's their goal, but I'll believe it when I see it type of thing. Yeah. I you guess know? we do too. <laughs> right. Um, I've been noticing like Quinn's drafts. I, I'm starting to think that he's learning from some mistakes. Um, I, I believe his drafts have gotten better. 
Um, there are, like I said, there are mistakes. Tease Tabor, I think, is a mistake. Jelani Tavai, I think the uh, the jury's still out on him. I would have rather had Greedy Williams personally, but that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. <laughs> but what are you seeing in the construction of this team via the draft? I think he's done largely a pretty good job, especially as you said. I think he's getting better and getting more comfortable as a drafter. And I would say the last couple of years since he's been drafting for Matt Patricia, he knows exactly what Matt Patricia wants, right? He knows what they need systematically. And that is helping him be a smarter, better drafter, in my opinion. And you look at that and yeah, his early drafts were rough, but he was trying to build roster depth. He was trying to construct something as a first time general manager and there is a learning curve there did he get too cute in certain situations jimmy landis probably being <laughs> the most notable one yes that first year long snappers. yeah he, he did and that and it, that i think was obvious pretty quick because they did it to his credit they didn't force jimmy landis onto the roster they stuck with dom Ulbach, who outplayed him the prior regime didn't do that when they drafted Nate Fries, even though Giorgio Tavecchio outkicked him. Now, granted, like we were talking about what if scenarios, all of that happens and they get Matt Prater and that stabilized their kicking situation and gave him one, a top five kicker in the league mm-hmm. because of all of those issues in 2014. So going back to Quinn before I go off on another, another tangent here. Yeah, I think he's gotten better as a drafter. I think he's drafting smarter. I think he's drafting two the strengths of what they need and he's willing to take big chances. And that to me has been impressive. It might not always make sense at the time, at the moment, Jelani Tavai being one Tracy Walker last year. Listen, no one knew who Tracy Walker was last year when he was drafted. I mean, I I remember looking him up and having to like really dig to find anything because played at a smaller school. No one was talking about him. And he himself even said he expected it to be a third day pick. Well, guess what? He's a he's a starter going into his second year as a third round pick, which is exactly what you want out of a third round pick, right? That's right. exactly what you hope for. Contributor year one, starter year two. And he looks really good and he's looked very, very good. And frankly, probably I mean, he was in my eyes kind of like a co starter by the end of the year last year because he was definitely take, taking reps from Glover Court. And that's a great draft pick. So I think you're seeing more of his ability to really draft to scheme and draft to player talent for what they want. And that can only help them. That's a very New England thing. It's part of why they took Jelani Tavai when they did. We'll see if it works out or not. But you look at some of his later draft picks so far, and I think, yeah, he's had some misses. Michael Roberts was a clear miss on the third day but he's had more hits than misses to me when you look at it jamal agnew sure defensively we don't know what he's going to be able to give you but he was an all pro returner as a rookie like i I don't care what happens the rest of the way with jamal agnew that's a win as a third day pick you drafted an all pro at some point deshaun hand looks like a steal on day three of the draft he does so you look at a lot of the a lot of the moves that they have made Jalen reeves maven as a fourth rounder i mean he looked really good against against houston and he's kind of dealt with injuries a little bit he's a guy who doesn't necessarily fit this scheme but he's play he's he's a really good special teams player and playing his way on the roster miles killebrew yeah he maybe never turned into the player that a lot of people thought he might but I mean, this goes obviously back to, you know, kind of that first draft a little bit of, um, yeah, but guess what? He's become a special teams dynamo. So he's found a good, he's done a good job of unearthing that third day talent. And even in that third, those third rounds, Kenny Galladay was a third round pick. Well, he's your number one receiver. You know, you, you look at that and he's done a good job. I think the back ends of the draft. And he's doing a better job now, I think, overall. I think he's been a pretty good drafter. I think that, yeah. you know, listen, I, I think on, on the whole, but he's done a good job. I know we were talking about it earlier and I said decent, but the more even we talk about it, I think he's done a good job as far as um, trade acquisitions, waiver wire, and um, draft. Free agency has been a little bit more scattershot, in my opinion, but yeah. 
Um, you know, I, I think that that's always a tougher that's a tougher place to look and a tougher place to go. And I think he's still done a decent job there. Marvin Jones was the best receiver on the market. He needed to sign Rick Wagner and TJ Lang. TJ just never really worked out because of injuries. Right. And, and Rick Wagner has been decent. We'll see kind of how that goes down the road. Um, you know, and obviously we'll see what happens with Trey Flowers. That's a biggie. And, mm-hmm. you know, they, they listen, they took a gamble on Ziggy Ansa last year, but it was a gamble they had to take because who else was out there? If Ziggy Ansa right. went to the market last year. Ziggy Ansa would have been the best pass rusher on the market. So you kept him with the franchise yeah. tag. And then he got hurt. And as you see in Seattle, he's dealing with injuries already again. That's unfortunately for for Ziggy Ansa just kind of what it is for him. Um, so, yeah, I think he's. I, I think he's drafting a lot better, and I think he's learning what his coach – I mean, he definitely knows what this coach needs, but he's, I think, able to really work it more and kind of swing deals, and he's not afraid to make trades. He's not afraid to make bold moves, and that's what you need to be as a GM in, in order to be successful. I do like a lot of things with Bob Quinn. Like he, if he makes a mistake, like Sylvester Williams or something like that, he cuts them. Yep. He don't yeah. keep them. Mm-hmm. So I, I like that about him. I do like some of the the diamonds that he's finding in the late rounds. Um, I love the Deshaun Hand pick. Um, there's some others that I think that are gonna. Uh, I think the kid from Clemson might be pretty good this year, but if he gets on the field, but, uh, there's an if right there. He's got to get on the field first. Yeah. Yeah, but I think he could make an impact, even as a backup. Uh, they already have a pretty good defensive line. I think they listed him as linebacker, I, I think. I can't remember yeah, right. Yeah, he's going to be in that, like, Devin Kennard mold. Austin where, Bryant, uh, yeah. Going both. At least, I, at least that's what it seems like. We haven't really seen him. So tell yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, we True. haven't seen him. But that's a tough kid, though. I mean, if he's dealing with something, he was dealing with a, what, torn peck the whole year? Last wow. year, yeah, something like that. Yeah, but I do like the the uh, ability of Bob Quinn to, to admit he's made a mistake. I think that's something that we haven't had here in a long time. Um, yeah. So I like that. Patricia's nope. a coach. I don't know. We had twelve men on the field again last night. I, I don't know. Some of that stuff does it for oh, me. It's, it, there's it's no doubt. It's, that's concerning. Uh, yeah. The and uh, this isn't me making excuses by any stretch of the imagination, but. It's a little bit different, I think, right now because of where he has to be because of the oh, Achilles injury. injury yeah. mm-hmm. So I don't know how how much – like he might have seen that if he were closer or been able to communicate that better. But that said, that's still on the coaching staff at, to kind of notice that. And the Lions went through that with Jim Caldwell you know, yep. consistently where there were 12 or 10. I think they had 13 once you know, type of thing that – you need to just be better at that. And that goes to what we were talking about at the top of what you need to see in the preseason. You don't want to see things like that. Like holding calls are going to happen, right? Like mm-hmm. pass interference calls are going to happen. Those are gameplay things. But the the procedure stuff, the false starts, which there haven't been, to my recollection, yeah, I, think, I, don't know. I don't think there hasn't been a false start yet. I think there but, was yeah. one yesterday. There was one yesterday? There yeah. was one yesterday? Okay, yes. I must admit. I must have missed that while I was writing or, or whatever. Um, no, but, it's okay. Yeah, but you, but that's what I'm saying. Like though, like the false starts, the too many men on the field, the some of those procedural penalties, the delay of games. That oh, yeah. not yeah. seeing that this year as much as you did a year ago in the preseason, and though that's what I'm talking about. Of like just the organizational stuff is is where I think you can get a gauge because last year. At this time, yeah, there. I remember writing like, "Listen, there's reason to be concerned because the effort wasn't there, and there were major like organizational like like I was saying like too many men on the field, et cetera, things like that, problems and issues. And you also had people in the locker room. Like remember, Ricky Jean Francois last year, basically at this point in the year was like, they got to get this stuff cleaned up, otherwise it's going to be a long year. It turns into a profit, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but, True. And, you're, you're just not – now maybe there just isn't an outspoken guy in the locker room to say that this year. I don't know. Um, but you're not hearing that type of thing this year, which makes me believe that, listen, this is just the preseason and and you should view it as such. 
versus, oh, my God, this is a giant red flag. You need to be really concerned. That this could be a really, really bad year. And you saw those signs last year where I'm not seeing those signs from those aspects of this year. I still don't know if it's going to be a good year or a bad year. I, I don't think anyone really knows that. But I'm not seeing those signs that screamed, man, there's there's some fundamental problems here. Well, I have them seven and nine this year, and that's based on schedule. First of all, I mean they pay, they just play a brutal schedule outside of Arizona. It's like the first seven games are pretty much awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're rough. But I mean, hey, look, look at the Chargers already. You don't know yeah. if Melvin Gordon's going to be there, and Derwin James isn't going to play. So, I, you know, I, I I think it's a difficult schedule. There's no mm-hmm. doubt I do, but let's see what happens as you go because. What was it last year, two years ago? You looked at it, and some of those more difficult games on the schedule were ones that by the time that game got around, that team was so different than what you thought they were going to be due to injury or play or whatever it was. So, yeah, on the face of it, yeah, it's a really tough schedule. It's why I'm probably living in that seven and nine, eight and eight world also. Um, Mm -hmm. And I haven't done my prediction yet, but. That's probably where I'll land just based off of how things go for me when I do those things. But, yeah, it's it's not an easy thing, and we'll see what happens. So this is a long, rambling answer that is kind of going nowhere. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's early. <laughs> yeah, that, that's yeah. the point. Is, is It's early, and you just don't really know yet. Right. right. We got to see what we got before we actually know what we got. Yeah. Right. You'll, you'll know – You'll know by week three mm-hmm. what you're really looking at this year. I, I truly believe that because you have a game you should win. They should win in Arizona. They just should, especially because Patrick Peterson's not going to play in that game. So you, you've got some advantages there, oh, theoretically. Their top, their top two corners are out for yeah. that game. Wow. Exactly. I mean, Peterson is the is a game breaker, though. Like we were yeah. talking about, like, yeah, there's two or three players that can make a difference for you. Mm-hmm. Like Peterson's that type of guy. Mm-hmm. So they should win that game, right? Mm-hmm. And then, but those next three, I mean, they're. I would be shocked if they're. They might be favored against the Chargers just because it's at home, but I don't know if they'd be favored in any of those games. And uh, to me, they're toss ups at best. And but if they play well, if they're competitive, if they steal one of them, I've I've long said wherever has me on over the last few weeks, if they go two and two in this first month. I, I if I'm the Lions, I take that as a win because of what you're dealing with schedule wise. Okay, we got about two minutes left of the show. Just letting you know, so sure. we, <laughs> we know yeah, what no we're worries. Here. Um, but have you looked at any of the other NFC North teams like Green Bay, uh, Chicago, Minnesota? What do you see out of them? Yeah, I've peeked at them really quick. I think Chicago is going to be really good this year again. Yeah. I, I like what you're. You know, they have to solve their kick. They have to solve their kicking issues. Right. But their defense is top notch. I think they added some some really good pieces on offense. Matt Nagy is going to be a second year head coach, so he's going to understand things a little bit more. They're going to be formidable. I think Minnesota will be good again defensively. I think they've last year was kind of an aberration. You figure Kirk Cousins maybe has more on offense, and they have obviously Dalvin Cook and Stephon Diggs, and then. I you can never really like count out the Packers with Aaron Rodgers. I think their defense has gotten better. I'll be curious to see how that offense looks since they've made that change in head coach from Mike McCarthy to Matt Lafleur. So that's a lo- that's a short long answer for saying I think this is a really competitive <laughs> yeah, I division. Know, we have very little time. No, it, right. it's a really really competitive division, and it's going to it's why as we were talking about the Lions could be a much better team this year and still be seven nine eight and eight and show progress, and that's right. because of what this division is going to look like this year. But, hey, I've said that before, and it's been not as good of a division, and I've thought it would be a weak division, and it's been one of the best in the NFL. So you just never really know. Okay, I want to ask you one more question. Um, Talking about the Lions going forward, how long do you think it's going to take before this team is like a Super Bowl contending team? So, yeah, there was a survey done – with writers and broadcasters from ESPN.com, they said generally four to five years away. I think it's going to be sooner than that if this regime is going to stick, right? To me, if this regime is going to stick, you need to show progress this year. And then to me, two years from now, 
if the Lions are actually being talked about as Super Bowl contenders, as winning the as contenders to win the NFC North, you still have Matthew Stafford in his prime. You have, depending on what they do with contracts, you have a lot of your playmate, your younger playmakers that you've drafted in their prime still on the roster, and you've had them together for a few years. That to me is when they can get to be a Super Bowl Super Bowl contender. If this doesn't work, right? Like if Matt Patricia, Bob Quinn, if the if what they're doing fails, if they lose their if they lose their jobs, if they're not showing progress, then I can't answer that question for you because I think that you're looking <laughs> at no, because I think you're looking at that point a complete rebuild. There's yep. I, I don't believe it's a coincidence that Matthew Stafford, Bob Quinn, and Matt Patricia's contracts all end at the same time. So yep. that to me says, listen, they're. They're going all the lines are going all in on this regime and this this construct. But if it doesn't work, they're giving whoever would be next if this doesn't work all of the outs to kind of completely rebuild. But obviously they're hoping that doesn't happen and they, they really believe in what in what they have here now. God, I hope so. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's been <laughs> Excuse me, that's been one of the problems is they just keep rebuilding and rebuilding. We get used to a coach and then something goes haywire. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then we're again. rebuilding again. Yeah. I was gonna say that's been the lament for what, thirty, forty years now? Yes. Exactly. It goes and then this team is built for Patricia. The, there's Yeah, there's, there's no doubt. Right. There's size and there's not as much speed as as some people would like, and, and it's just all set up for him. If they have to have a new regime, they got to get rid of almost everybody. Yeah, <laughs> Right, yeah, it's not going to be – I mean, but you saw that even from Caldwell to Patricia. You saw yeah. that from Schwartz. You saw that, I think, less from Schwartz to Caldwell. Yeah. But you saw that definitely from Caldwell to Patricia, um, both on offense and on defense, the, the amount of turnover that has been there. So, yeah, absolutely. If they have to – if they have to go with the new regime, especially because it would probably be a new GM, new coach, potentially, like, yeah, you're you're probably starting from from the bottom again, and that might, depending on why that happens, that could include quarterback as well. So yeah, you're really, it probably would at that point. Well, I mean, who, if Stafford plays really, really well, and the defense is just you know Saints two thousand like you know six fifteen sixteen when they were terrible bad. Then mm-hmm. maybe you don't do that. That's up to probably again. And this is way in the future. That's up to new GM, new coach. If that ever, if that happens, but yeah, you're pro- probably you're probably looking at a complete overhaul uh, yeah. at that point. Which that's too far in the future for us to think about at this point. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, and it is because you just don't know like what they'll bring in and what. Yeah, and you don't and you don't know how this season is going to go, and, and this season could, you know, I, I still think that there's a decent possibility that this all works out. Like yeah. I, I haven't seen yeah. enough to say it absolutely won't yet. Um, you know, usually either. takes a couple years for that. All right, well, we really appreciate you being on the show with us today, Mike, <laughs> and uh, hopefully you'll be able to come on again sometime later. But we really appreciate this, and uh, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, no, really enjoyed it. Thank you guys for having me. All right. Have a good day now. Take care. Yep. Okay, we really want to thank Mike Rothstein from ESPN for coming on the show with us today and enjoying our Lions talk. We could have went longer, but, <laughs> but we were like, we got to let the poor man do what he needs to do. So anyway, Tim, take us home this week. Okay. Well, always remember, go Lions. Lions on prowl. One pride. Go Lions. And I also want to tell you, guys, you can listen to us at iHeartRadio, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts from, like iTunes. So we will see you next week.